So today's lecture is just a supplement to the WPF lecture. What I found in the past is sometimes students struggle just sort of getting into WPF. So I just want to go over it again and just kind of cover the basics just so you feel comfortable doing it with your assignments. So some quick background, WPF stands for Windows Presentation Foundation. It was introduced in .NET 3.0. It's a XML based language that describes how your user interface should look. So here's a simple WPF app that I've created and let's just go ahead and start at the top. So in this case we've got a window control that first contains our application. Inside of it we've got this class tag that you'll notice has the namespace and the class name. So if we come over here you can see here's the namespace and here's the class name. And that's what links up this XAML file to our C -sharp file. Also, we have these various tags that we can set. So each control is going to have these tags, which are the properties that we set over here. This should be very similar, just like Windows Forms. Within our window, we need some sort of control to contain all of the, the sub-controls. So some of the more popular ones are like the grid or the canvas. And so if I put a canvas in here, this is what I would recommend, if you're especially if you're having trouble getting WPF to do what you want it to do, I would just recommend using a canvas control for right now. Now in the real world, a canvas control is great, but it doesn't offer you the flexibility that something like a grid control will do. So it really depends on your end product of whether or not you want to use a canvas or a grid. In this case, you can see I've dragged a button on here, and as I move this around, you can see that it's going to change this canvas.left and canvas.top. So these are what are called attached properties. And it's just telling you, hey, input relative to this canvas, these are the positions I want to put this button. And so it acts just like Windows Forms in that everything is locked in and it has to do with pixels on placement and things like that. So also with a button control or all controls, we can come over here and you can sort it by category or you can sort it by name. And from there, you really just have to take the time to kind of start just searching through here and picking out the, the various control or the various properties that you're going to be using most often, something like content, for example, for the, the, the string that we're going to use within here. And also remember, anything you set over here can also be set here in our XAML. And you can see we've got a nice IntelliSense that comes up here. So if I want to change the effect, for example, I could just type it in and I could just hard code it right there rather than having to deal with the properties. Pretty straightforward, things like fonts and things like that. In WPF, there is a, a difference between Windows Forms where the is a lot of things are like is cancel, is default, is enabled. So just kind of be aware of that. And then also the visibility, where in the past it was just true or false, but here the visibility has to do with collapsed, which means that the controls actually don't exist at runtime. Like it actually will make this whole control not exist within the XAML. And that can be helpful sometimes. It really, again, it just depends on your use case. There's also hidden, which just acts like normal, where it just makes this control hidden, and then visible is obviously makes it visible. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at maybe something like a label. So same sort of thing. Come over here, and for a label, you can see that we've got a text property. Or sorry, width property. Oh, I missed it. Where is it at? Okay, where's it going? Oh, it's because I didn't click on it. That's what was wrong. All right, so with that said, you'll notice we've got this content here of our label, and also we've got all these events. Now, just like a button, every control is going to have various events that you can handle. So again, I just recommend you go through here and just kind of get an idea of the various events that are available to you, that you can handle them, and then have some code execute once this event works. So a button's a little bit more familiar to us. So if we did this and we let's say we double clicked our button, you can see it actually go ahead and it creates that button click event for me. Now what did it really do? Well all it does in WPF is adds this little tag here. And then it creates the code that actually links up the button click to this. Now if we come over here, you can see here's where this is. So if I put something different in here, you can see it changed it there and actually gives me a new event down here. So that's how controls over here link up in the code based on the various events. So I'm going to go ahead and delete these now. And we'll move on. Let's talk about, let's say, a stack panel. So I'm going to go ahead and just drag a stack panel on here. And now you'll notice it throws it in there for me. Now a stack panel is used to hold 
other controls and they stack them one on top of each other. So for instance, let's go ahead and just do a button. And I'm going to say it's content equals, you know, hello. Now you can see that this button is taking up the whole side or the whole width there. Let's go ahead and add another one and then add another one. And you can kind of get the idea that as we add more buttons, see I'm not telling it the position within the stack panel. So like our other controls that were part of the canvas, I was actually having to tell it where to go. But now for the, my buttons that are within my stack panel, you can see that they're just relative to the other controls. Also, I can also set the orientation property so I could change this to horizontal if I wanted to. And you can see how they're just sort of stacked on top of each other. And we could do things like we could set margins if we wanted to. And that would give us a little bit of space around our buttons. You could set margins just on one side. But it's just really nice to be able to just stack things one on top of the other without having to worry about the positions between the different controls. So the next thing I want to cover is the grid. Now the grid can definitely be a little tricky, but just it's just a table. And so let's pretend we're going to create maybe a basic template for something like a calculator. We're not going to make it look exactly to this one, nor am I going to fully code it. I'm just going to give you an idea where we saw this. And OK, so we say, OK, how many rows and columns do we have? Well, you'll notice we got one row, and then two, three, four, five rows, and one, two, three, four columns. Again, we're not going to make it exact. So we'll just pretend we're going to have five rows and four columns. So I'll move that off. Now. Before we do that, we say, OK, so we've got our grid. And we noticed right here, here's our columns definitions. Here's our row definitions. So let's say we're going to set our row definitions. And now, this is what Knight's about IntelliSense because, you know, I, whoops. I always forget the syntax or what these things are called. So it's kind of nice that it just pops right up with these. Now for this one, we're going to set OK, so for this row definition, sorry about that, we're going to set its height. I was, I was thinking it was the other, one, other way around. So we're going to set the height. We're just going to do this to star. And now let's go ahead and let's go ahead and just create our five rows. And you can see now it's actually created our five rows for us. Now we can go ahead and start creating our columns. So we'll go like this, grid.columns, create our column definitions. Now we'll do each of our columns. And here, rather than height, we're going to do width. And we'll also just make that star. Two, three, four. Now it's not exact. And, and there are ways to make this. You can do a, a column span for this one if you actually wanted to. Um, anyways. I don't need to do it here to prove it to you. Um, so just make sure if you really want to make this look exact, you could do a, a column span on this column definition, but we're not going to worry about it. So now that we created this, we can now reference where we want to put certain controls. So for instance, maybe we wanted a label with the content of, you know, let's just say this is where the seven key should be. Now we need to tell it where the position should be. So let's say it's going to be right here. So this is row 0, this is row 1, so we want it in row 1, and then we want grid.column, and we're going to have that in 0. So we'll do that, now let's complete our, and you can see that there's that. Let's also maybe just add a background, just do something like red, and just so you can kind of see where it's at. Now again, we could adjust the font and do everything like that, but I just want to give you an idea of how you could actually, you know, determine where these should actually be, these numbers. So now let's say we want the number 8, so we could put it here. Here's 8, same row. We're going to move one over one column, make that black around blue. And so I think you kind of get the gist of you know how you then correspond the rows and columns to the grid you just created. And you can have grids within grids and you know all kinds of different controls through here. And if you just sort of plan it out and just work on one section at a time, I think that'll really help you with your application. And so now if we were to run this, what's nice about using that grid 
as you can see that those actually grow and shrink based on the size of my window. Now maybe that's what you want, maybe it's not. I mean you have to kind of decide you know, how you want it to look. For example, if I come back to this calculator over here and I expand and contract it, you can kind of see how there is some flow to it. And then they even say as you get bigger and bigger, you can see it comes up with other little sides and you could do the same thing. So this flexibility right here is exactly what you're looking for using WPF versus Windows Forms. So I hope this kind of helped a little bit, just kind of get you into WPF and let me know if you have any questions.